Good morning. Oh, my goodness. I didn't realize I was talking, and I, they started playing, and I had to get up here. Hey, let me get, tell you some of the announcements we have going on. Um, Y'all remember that weird announcement I made about we had enough macaroni? Uh, that was a, a miscommunication, maybe on my part, maybe not, that, no, we love macaroni. That wasn't what we were talking about. All right, what was going on is WMU and Brotherhood are taking up for, oh, what's it called? C. Child Advocacy Center, and people have been donating to that. Keep doing that. If there's any staples, any goods, canned goods, anything like that, they were just saying, we have a lot of boxes of macaroni. I thought we were talking about Thanksgiving dinner. And I was like, well, how do you know? We, how can you have too much macaroni? So if you're signing up for Thanksgiving dinner coming up, uh, be sure. And if you want to bring macaroni, you bring macaroni. No matter what the WMU says, and we'll do it anyway, so in defiance. All right, well, um, let's see. What else we got in our announcements? That looks about it. We got our no service the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and we got Thanksgiving dinner coming up. And like I said, that's a church-wide thing. Everybody's invited to it November 19th at 5 p.m. And uh, please come be a part of it. If you want to contribute to it, the sign-up board is out there. All right, as far as announcements go, you've been seeing them on the, on the bulletin board and uh, in, your, in your bulletins and all that stuff, but I want to get to a biggie, is that it is Veterans Day celebration this weekend, and we are blessed to have so many veterans in our church that have served this country and served faithfully, and if you have served our country in any way, whether you visitor or a member, would you stand with us for a moment, just all the servers. Thank you. Now, we just want to say thank you for your service. Thank you for the freedom we enjoy to be able to come and to worship Almighty God without the fear that our brothers and sisters in other churches face, in other countries, I should say. So it is a privilege and honor, and thank y'all for your service. Uh, I have always been ashamed that I didn't serve. I should have served, but I was a stupid kid, and I did stupid things, and I should have served. I should have been in the military. So I joined the Lord's Army and uh, did that. But I always respect you guys and girls that did that and served and that are serving. So I want to pray for you, pray for this church service, and let's begin worshiping God. Father, we thank you. For all our veterans that have served in all the different branches of military government, Lord, we thank you for those that have many. In Memorial Day, we celebrate those who have laid down their lives for this cause. And we celebrate now, today, those who have given their lives to this. Lord, as we come together, though, we know that the freedom we enjoy is nothing compared to the freedom in Christ. Lord Jesus, you set us free. You set us free from the bondage of sin. You set us free from ourselves. You have delivered us and given us the right to be called children of God. We praise your name, Lord Jesus. You are the great liberator. And as we worship today, we glorify you. We lift you up. We praise your name. We sing these songs to only you. And when we get into this time of your word, I pray, God, that you will be blessed. You will be honored. And you will be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Let's all stand for our praise time this morning. We have a new one. It's called, I tried to rename it the other day. It's Lion and the Lamb, right? Yes. Lion yeah. I tried to rename it to Lion of Judah, but no, that's not it. It's the Lion and the Lamb. If, you've, uh, if you listen to contemporary Christian music, then you've probably heard it before. Um, it may be a little bit different than it's on the radio, but we'll catch on. <laughs>
to that question of who can stop the Lord Almighty is what? No. Oh, come on now. All together now. No. Okay. No one. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Is no one. Let's turn in our handles to number 206. Blessed be the name.
203. <clears throat> His name is wonderful. Let's sing this through two times. I hope I wasn't too much of a distraction during worship because I sat over there and I thought, I might need a Bible. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's on the screen, but I like to have it. So, In James chapter 2 is where we're going to be. We're picking back up with our series through the book of James. Not going to hit everything in James, but as the Lord leads and guides... We're looking at chapter 2, verse 1 to begin with, and if you can and will, stand with me for the reading of God's Word. And we're going to walk through verse by verse by verse. My brothers, another version says my brothers and sisters, we're not, we're not keeping anybody out, They're just inclusive here. My brothers, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Father God, we pray that we not be guilty of what we're going to learn here in James. Thank you for your brother and him as a pastor and what he was passing on to his congregation and how it can bless us as a church. We pray, Lord, that you move, you speak, you work in this place. For us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. All right, so we're going to walk through this. So our text shows us that our faith is supposed to remove any discrimination that could be in the heart. You say, I don't have any discrimination in my heart. Uh, well, everybody's got something, okay? Some got a lot more than others, but everybody's got something. I would have told you when I was in New Orleans and, and I was working in the Ninth Ward area and I was going into these these areas and throwing horseshoes as an evangelism tool with all these old guys in the projects and, and I would we'd go in and out and pick people up with the bus and do all these things, I would have told you in my heart of hearts, I had no discrimination in my heart. Till this young lad came running up to me and slapped me in my chest and said, what's up? 
And when he hit me in my chest, everything in me flew up. Every redneck thing about me flew up. Don't you put your hands on me. And I was surprised at my reaction to this young man. You say, Brother Wayne, you're a horrible person. I know. That was a long time ago, 20-something years ago. But I didn't think it was there. I didn't think it was in me. I never would have dreamed that was in me. And you know what? Me and that boy, we ended up, and I say boy because he's young. He was a teenager. We ended up spending a lot of time together, doing evangelism together, going in those places together. I went with him to the hospital and prayed over his mother that was dying with AIDS. I spent time with him in, in, in places that he shouldn't have been. He's in the military now. He's serving our country. You know, but that young man that I'm proud of his life and how he turned out was there when he got saved, there when he was baptized, did ministry with him. He showed me that there was something in my heart that I didn't realize was there. And I had to deal with it. So when we look at our text, what we're learning here is that your faith in Christ is supposed to eliminate every bit of discrimination that might be in your heart. Every bit of favoritism that you might be playing in your mind. Because you can't mix the faith in Jesus with all that garbage that the world brings into us. And the world is seeking to divide every one of us. Because they do not want us to come together. They want us to be divided by race. They want us to be divided by economic situation. They want us to be divided by privilege. They want us to be divided in every way we can be divided. Because if we ever come together under the banner in the name of Jesus, we will make a difference in this world for the name of Christ. And the enemy will continue and continue to put a divide between the children of God. And it's not right. You can't claim to have faith in Christ and have this going on in your heart. So James saw a problem in his church. Now y'all remember when, when I started this James thing, I started telling y'all how much I love y'all. Because James is tough. James tears the church down. So for anybody that's thinking, I wonder what happened at the church. Nothing happened. It's just, it's the Bible. We didn't have anything. Nobody has come to me and said, oh, this or no, none of that. But let's talk about the Bible. If, if we don't deal with this, it has serious implications for the body of Christ if we're divided by anything, by any stance. And it can be politics, it can be money, it can be color, it can be anything. And if we divide ourselves based on these parameters, and if we can't come together in the name of Christ then we're going to have a problem. The problem is, in our text, favoritism or a prejudice, if you will. And what they got going on isn't necessarily a prejudice about color or anything. It's about somebody that's more prominent, more important than somebody else coming into the church. And the church folks were treating people like they were less than, and some others like they were better than somebody else. And God is like, we don't do that. And James, through the leadership of the Holy Spirit, comes up and says, hey church, we don't do that. So James's church, it, it was evident in the treatment of the wealthy people versus the poor people that they had prejudice in their hearts. That's what was going on with James. A rich person shows up at the church, he got special privilege. A poor person shows up at the church, he's not treated the same. And James is like, it's just wrong. So James is telling this church, if you're a professing Christian, if you're a professing faith in Christ, you have no space in your heart or mind to be a spiritual bigot. You cannot do it. It's not allowed. So let's look at verses 1 through 4 now. All right, I'm going to go back to verse 1. The rich, the richer, the poor. You remember, uh, I don't know if anybody ever does it anymore. I think the last wedding I did, we didn't even say it. In a wedding, you're for richer or poorer. That's something we are to adopt as a church. No matter the status of somebody, my brother, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. So in James's day, 
the Jews in, in, in this church loved, and this, this is just studying, this isn't bashing Jews, this is a historical fact. The Jews loved the high seats of honor and the high status that came with it. What did you see in the Bible? If you read through the gospel, especially in Mark chapter 10, Jesus' two disciples, the, the sons of thunder, James and John, pestering Jesus, Apparently, repeatedly, we get an instance of it, but apparently it kept on going on and on. Even got their mama involved. It's one of those things where, well, mama, you ask them on our behalf and we'll be. They wanted the best seats of honor. They wanted to sit at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus. And they kept on until they made all the other apostles angry. Why are they angry? They're probably disappointed. They didn't think of it themselves. So everybody's mad at everybody. You think, oh, the apostles wouldn't be mad at each other. They were always mad at each other. That's probably times that came to blows and we just don't know about it, you know. Listen, they, they are men. They are following Jesus. But they've got that prejudice of heart to where I want to be elevated to a status next to Jesus. And Jesus is like, you, you, you don't know what you're asking. And so it was in the culture. So in verse 1, what is James saying? He's saying, don't be a spiritual snob. Don't sit there and think. Don't join in with a little clique in the church. Now, I've only been here about eight months, but I don't think... I hadn't noticed cliques. If y'all got them, y'all hide them real well. I don't know. Time may tell. But I've seen plenty of cliques in churches. And I've served in churches that had cliques. And... James is really clear that you can't have a clique in the church. Oh, yeah, you got your friends you get along with better than others. That's all fine. But you can't have this idea that we are better than them, so therefore we come over here and we look down our noses at this group. They're just not one of us or a part of us. And I've seen it in churches. I have seen kids come in to the church off the street and come up to the youth group to talk to them and all the little pretty girls over here talking and the girl comes up and they turn their back on her. You can't be a part of our conversation. Don't tell me that stuff doesn't happen in a church. It was happening in James's church. And it cannot be a part of who we are. Like I said, I hadn't seen it, but let's make sure it doesn't start. So the saints, and this, all right, if a saint walks in this church, that's your brother in Christ. If a sinner walks into this church, that's what you used to be. So you should have compassion and mercy. You shouldn't treat somebody else better than somebody else in the church. In Acts chapter 10, verse 34. God showed no favoritism. Peter, Simon Peter, is on the rooftop and God unveils to him all these different fruit foods and everything that he can take part in and commanded him to eat them in Acts chapter 10, 9 through 12. And after Peter wondered within himself about this vision, he said this, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. So we got James saying it, and now we got Peter saying it. God doesn't care who you are. God doesn't care if you're that important. He's God. God doesn't see one person more important than the other. There's no favoritism with God. God sees us as a bunch of equal sinners in need of salvation through the shed blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. So God looks at everybody from the most prominent person in the community to the lowliest beggar in the community as equal before his eyes. So we should. There's nobody better than anybody else. So let's look at verse 2. For example, so this is how you know James was a pastor. He's got illustrations. Okay. For example, a man comes into your meeting. Apparently this happened. Wearing a gold ring. Now I'll tell you, when you study into this, it wasn't just a ring. Dude had all the fingers covered, you know. It was like, you ever seen, it always weird to me when a man has every, a, what is that? Anyway, he got so many rings, it's like brass knuckles coming in, you know. 
So a man comes into your meeting wearing a golden ring and dressed in fine clothes, and a poor man dressed in dirty clothes also comes in. So here's our illustration, okay? Not, not a single ring, a bunch of rings all over the finger. The, the rich man comes in and makes his grand entrance. Here I am. He, he busts in the door. He's the kind of guy that he's talking about. You can be rich and not do this. But this guy's coming in, and he's not coming in going, hey, how are you? He's coming in going, hey, here I am. And that guy's, he's problems. He, he's issues. So let's look at verse 3. If you look with favor on the man wearing the fine clothes and say, sit here in a good place, and yet you say to the poor man, stand over there, or even my favorite, Sit here on the floor by my footstool. Wow. So this is going on. Did you know there was a time in the body of Christ that people had pews they paid for? There would be a door on the pew. And if you gave a certain amount, you had the privilege and the key to that pew, and that was your special pew, and you put your little key in, and all your little old family could just go over there and sit down, and nobody else could sit at your pew. You know, that's why a lot of us go, if somebody sits in our seat, we lose our mind. <laughs> like there ain't somewhere else for you to place your rear end. <laughs> what is he? That, don't they know that's my seat? No, they don't know it's your seat. They're visiting. They don't know it's your Because it's not your seat. It's a place for you to sit. Now, I understand. If y'all move around too much, I get confused. I, you know, so I'm all about you sitting in the same spot every time. But if somebody decides to come visit and they sit in somebody's seat, you better not go up to them because I have seen it in church. Excuse me, you're sitting in my seat. No, ma'am. No, ma'am, you just sit somewhere else. We're not, these are not seats of privilege. These are not seats of whatever. You can walk two more steps and sit down, you know. But what a, what a, what a way to look at the church. Well, here we have that... These individuals are saying, oh, 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 you come. And they want to sit on the front. They want to be seen. They got the robe, the rings, the everything. I walked in, the rich man. And when he sits down, all the rest of the congregation is supposed to go, oh, how privileged we are that this rich man walked up into our church. I'm going to talk about a past church so you know I'm not talking about this church. I was in a church in Tuscaloosa. I was on staff. I hadn't done any, there wasn't an issue, but some of the men came in just to inform me as a new staff member. I was the family pastor. And they came into my office and they, Brother Wayne, you need to know something about our church. I said, yes, sir, what is that? So-and-so in our church is a millionaire. I said, well, that's great. Why are you telling me this? Well, you just got to know. There are certain things that we do to keep him happy. And, and when he wants us to do that, we, we try to, we always try, because Brother Wayne, he's a millionaire. I said, I heard, I, I get you. I said, you know, we're just going to do what God wants us to do. And he can get with it or he can get out of the way. I don't know what to say, you know. And that millionaire came to my office to check me out because he was so important. He was so this and that. And anyway, I said, I serve God. Here's the thing that happens in a church. Sometimes we go, oh, that person's got deep pockets. Oh, that person's, they, so, so they're more, their, their opinion is more valuable than the little old lady's opinion that's been praying for the last six months about this issue because he ain't prayed a bit, but he's got a little money, so we're going to listen to him. Listen, you can't do that as a church. You can't do that as a body. James is saying, don't do that. The Bible is saying, don't show favoritism. I've had people take me by the hand and take me down the aisle and say, Brother Wayne, come with me. Look, do you see that golden plaque on the end of the pew? I said, yes, sir. He said, that's my pew. I bought that pew. And I looked at him and I said, well, why do you sit in the back? He said, well, I don't like to sit up here. 
I said, well, do we need to move your pew to the back of the church so that you can have your pew to sit on? No, it's, it's okay for other people to see it, but you need to know I paid for that pew. I was so glad when I came in here that there wasn't golden heifers on everything in this church. Plaques everywhere. Well, that's how we paid for it. That's how we did it. You can't be all about that. We have to be about what God is doing. There may be some value in the person who is the millionaire that has great advice, that's very spiritual and loves the Lord. But we can't be afraid that if, if we offend this guy, then like the whole church is going to fall in. Because I'm going to tell you, that man that they came to me about, honest truth, my hand on the Bible, within a year, that man had lost everything and gone bankrupt. And it came out, he didn't even contribute to the church financially. And everybody was so worried about keeping him up. Listen, God is going to provide for this church. God is going to lead this church. God will make sure the coffers are full. God will make sure we have what we need. We can't sit there and say, well, that person's more important than that person. The little old lady, when Jesus is standing there and she goes and puts her little coin in to the offering and all these other guys are putting big money in, and Jesus is like, she gave more than the rest of them. God can take that little coin. God can take that dollar. God can take that little bit that is given with everything you've got in your heart and He can multiply it and do amazing things with it and you can take a billion dollars and run a church into the ground. We're not about the money. We're about making sure that there's value in every person and every soul. And if you're one of those people that you want a high seat and you want to be important and you want everybody to look at you, you better be careful you better make sure you're spiritual. You better make sure God's in it. Because God can take it away. Because God's the one that gave it. And God can remove it. Favoritism over race. I know about a nursing home. I know because we were part of it. That they tried to have a church service. And, all, and it breaks my heart to say it. All the retired nursing home pastors that were white wouldn't come into the service. I said, why won't they come? It was because there were black residents in the worship service. That's just evil. That's just evil, and that happened. I was at a church for two years, and I started working with a, a, a black man in the, that had a church, a pastor, and he didn't have any support. He didn't have anybody. And, buddy, he was solid theologically. And I started talking to him, hey, come over with us. We'll help you. We'll support you. Uh, the cooperative program has things to help you. Just come be a part of us. His theology was so solid, he lined up with us completely. And I worked with him with over a year to come over. And when he came over and I preached at his church and I did all this stuff and the Certain men, leaders, deacons of the church came to me and said, they're not allowed in our church. Don't tell me this kind of stuff doesn't happen. The most segregated place in America right now is the church. The church. It's not right. Anybody that loves the Lord Jesus, anybody seeking the Lord Jesus, they are welcome in this place. And if you don't like it, you need to get out. You need to find you. There's plenty of bigots you can have so-called church with, but that ain't no New Testament church you in because the New Testament makes it very clear. And they told me when we were in the hall, I said, what is your problem with them coming and being a part? I said, they're 15 miles down the road. We're not even incorporating together. They said, we host all the association things at our church because we're an important church, and they're going to think they can come in our church and use our bathrooms and drink out of our water fountains. And I stopped and said, is it 1922? And I saturated that place with my absence. Because that's not a New Testament thing. That is wrong. That is a holdover of prejudice and evil. And you can't claim to have faith in Christ and feel that way about another person. Listen, I started out talking about prejudice in my heart that I didn't even know was there. I'm not trying to make it like I'm so great. I've had to come through a lot. 
I was raised to hate. I was great. My father raised me to hate. Y'all remember the Jeffersons? Moving on up. Yeah. You should love that show, man. Sitting there watching it. My father sitting over there smoking a joint, watching the Jeffersons, laughing his tail off. I don't know if it's because they're funny or because of what he was doing. And I was laughing and we were laughing. And y'all remember there's this character in the Jeffersons where there's a white man married to a black woman. And my father stops laughing, looks at me, and says, if you ever marry a black woman, I'll kill you, her, and all your children. We was just laughing. I didn't know all that stuff, man. I was raised in that. I saw all that. And then I came to Jesus. And Jesus is like, I love everybody. And you're going to love everybody. I died for everybody. Show me where Jesus didn't die for everybody. Jesus, at the cross, we are all on equal ground. At the cross, we all bow down. Do you think for a moment when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ that you're going to go, well, I was rich. He doesn't care. I was white. He doesn't care. I was a black pastor. He doesn't care what he cares about. Do you love me? Did you keep my commandments? Because Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And all these Baptists run around going, well, I'm saved. I can do whatever I want to. No, you can't. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep your commandments. So, now we go to verse 4. Haven't you discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? That's big. So again, favoritism is wrong. Let's look at, it's a sin. Yeah, don't think about it being a sin. Look at verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, is in the text. Didn't God choose the poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? All right. Some of the poorest believers in the world have, have the richest spirits within them. Miss Elizabeth, Miss Elizabeth didn't have two nickels to rub together. Miss Elizabeth had nothing. In Slap Out, Alabama, after Hurricane Katrina, I ended up in a place called Slap Out, Alabama, and it's real. I had the T-shirt. I bought a T-shirt at a gas station while I was there. I'd wear it to seminary, and they'd go, where are you? I said, I ended up in Slap Out, Alabama, after Katrina. And uh, it's just what you think it is. And we met this little old lady, and she was so godly, and she was blind, and she lived in a trailer falling down around her. And that woman, she's the one I talk about. When you'd go see her, and you felt like she saw through you. She had the smoke of the presence of God and the Holy Spirit still on her. That woman was so godly. She was praying all day, reading her Bible all day through the little... She couldn't see anymore, and she had the little CDs and the cassettes, and she put the headphones... On, and that's how she got her Bible, and she was just praying. And praying. One of the most godly spiritual people I have ever met, and she didn't even have enough money for food. Do you think God loves somebody else more than her? But she would come into a church, and there are churches and people that would have just said, you sit over here, you poor little blind lady. This guy's a millionaire. Stupidity in the congregations, has to astonish the Lord Jesus Christ. Someday we'll give an answer to God if we treat people differently. Heirs to the kingdom. Do you remember what Jesus said about the wealthy? It's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than it is for a rich man, basically, to receive salvation. Didn't say it was impossible because he went on to say all things are possible with God. Because the disciples are like, well, how can anybody be saved? Exactly. But not all things are possible with God. But in church history and looking at the scripture, the poor historically are more apt to receive Christ than the prosperous. Why do you think... If you look and see the churches that the Holy Spirit of God is moving and miracles are happening and tons of people are getting saved and we put a map up and we 
put dots on that map, the areas where more people are coming to Christ. It's the poorest countries around the world. The most prosperous countries, hardly anything. And so it's our verse. That's our verse. He chose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. That was his decision. God chose to do that. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And people often choose money over God. And Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 12, Paul tells us it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. And if you, There's nothing wrong with having the money, but if it's the love of money, that's opening you up for the things of this world and make you do ungodly stuff because of the love of money. Because you know the best way to get money a lot of times is to cheat and to lie on your taxes and to do all these other things. The love of money. I went to, I was in Opelika and I went to a um, grocery store to pick up something as I was headed out from the hospital. And you all know these self checkouts are from the pit of hell, you know, they're just awful. And somebody said they're waiting on their W-2 form because I've been working at Walmart for the last two years, you know. I, I, so I'm checking myself out and doing all this stuff. And I got all this on my mind. My phone's buzzing. Everything's going. I go get out to the car, and I realize I have just stolen 20 chicken nuggets. And I'm going to tell you, I wasn't tempted to steal it for the money. I was tempted to get in the car and drive on because I'm like, well, that's what they get for me having to check myself out. <laughs> if they were checking me out, that wouldn't ever happen. Shame on them. And then I'm like, I just don't want the hassle of going back in. So I walk in with my chicken nuggets, and the lady looks at me, what are you doing? I said, I appreciate the fact that y'all didn't tackle me when I went out with these chicken nuggets. The pastor on the news stealing chicken nuggets at the Kroger. <laughs> So I went and paid for them. You know why? Because God sees all this. It's not a thing of, oh, look at me, I'm trying to... No, don't have a love of the money because it's going to lead you to all kinds of other things. And then let's look at verse 6. 6 hits hard. Yet you dishonor the poor man. Don't the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Now they were having issues that we don't have with that. But... Listen, the, this, this fits in with the rich trying to run the church, control the church, doing all this stuff. James is like, don't let that happen. Everybody has the same level before God. And then in verse 7, don't they blaspheme the noble name that was pronounced over you at your baptism? What name is that? The name of Jesus. What does it mean that they're blaspheming? The word is insult. Don't they insult the name of Jesus? Don't they drag you into court? Don't they oppress you? Why are you taking somebody in your church because he's got a ring on every finger and a fine robe and giving him the best seat in the church when he oppresses you and insults the name of Jesus? Have you lost your minds? But you sit over here at my feet. Verse 7. I mean, verse 8. Indeed, you have kept the royal law prescribed in the Scriptures. What in the world is that? All right, the royal law is connecting with the kingdom of God. All right, it's connecting the law of the Old Testament covenant with the New Testament's kingdom of God that's being talked about. And so the kingdom of God being connected, that's prescribed in the Scriptures because that goes directly against love your neighbor as yourself. You can't choose one and show favoritism one over the other because then you're not loving your neighbor. You're not loving the other guy. So we got to be equal. I had a, a new, I was told a story about a guy that in his class, he's a teacher in his classroom, and somebody told him he was racist. And he said, Oh, no, I'm not racist. I don't like anybody. I'm an equal opportunist. I don't like people. It's like, why are you in the school system? But, so you can't go that route and you can't go, well, I just don't like anybody. No, you got to love everybody. We can work on liking. 
I can love my neighbor, that doesn't mean I got to go fishing with them, you know, kind of thing. But I love them and I won't do them any harm. So here we have an individual that you got to love everybody equally. And if you show favoritism in any way, the problem is that you all of a sudden have broken the second greatest commandment according to the scripture, loving your neighbor. You can't do that. And it contradicts that in verse 9. But if you show favoritism, you commit to sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. So it's a sin. God doesn't show favoritism. In Peter, he said, God is not a respecter of persons. Look at verse 13. I know we're lingering. I'm going to get you out of here. For judgment is without mercy to the one who hasn't shown mercy, mercy triumphs over judgment. The best thing you can do to keep from falling under the judgment of God is to err on the side of mercy and kindness and gentleness towards somebody else. We talked about that last week, and it shows up here. So mercy is the answer. You, have you received mercy from God? Then you should show mercy. Mercy. If somebody isn't willing to show mercy, it appears that they've never received mercy. And it's hard. It's hard sometimes. Sometimes it's a supernatural act of God for you to be able to show mercy to that individual. But that is the glory to the God of heaven and shows His existence and shows His great evidence that He exists before a fallen and dying world that you who receive so much mercy can stand back and say, Ere but for the grace of God go I. So therefore I won't show mercy condemnation and judgment and I won't show favoritism against you I'm just going to love you because you're my neighbor and I'm going to work on liking it prejudices are the chains forged by ignorance to keep men apart nothing would make God have you ever thought about making God happy it hit me the other day I did a thing and it hit me that this thing that I was doing made God happy. See, I'm always about keep your nose clean, keep your shoulder to the grindstone, do what God has called you to do, face what you've got to face, keep rolling, keep doing, get knocked down, get up, keep going, keep pushing. It, it, it never dawns on me, because I'm doing it for Jesus, I'm doing it for God, but it never dawns on me to look up and, and realize that maybe Jesus is happy that I did something in His name. And it hit me the other day, and my eyes just welped up, welled up, and my heart just felt... I was, a, I was like, why have I never thought about what it's like to make God smile? Never felt like I could make God smile. And if, if you have issues in your past with a father that's abusive, you have a hard time reconciling the God of the Bible as your father and seeing Him completely the way He needs to be seen. And that can mess with you. But to understand that when you do these things that we're talking about, especially here in James this morning, God looks at you with joy. And that should be more important to your life than anything in this world that God would look upon you and take joy in what you are doing in His name. But if you do the other, God looks upon you with disappointment and sadness. And the Bible tells us that we grieve God. It's a sinful thing to think we're better than anybody else. It's a simple thing to look down on anybody, no matter who that person is, no matter who you are, we're equal before the cross. So I would like to just challenge our church. I've toyed with, how do you do an invitation on something like this? Because who's going to get up and go, oh yeah, I'm a racist, let me go pray, you know. Nobody's going to do that. Oh, yeah, I, I, do, I did favoritism. Thank you for pointing that out so that I can stop. So I'm not calling for that. You go out in the parking lot and cry and ask God for forgiveness. What I'm calling, if, you want to, if you're bold enough to come down and say it, we'll let you do it. But how about this? If you're able, just pray that nobody 
use anything to separate us from the other children of God. That God, I believe God is starting to do something to send people to us that may look different, act different, talk different, and you need to say, hallelujah, glory, praise to his name. And if you want to see, what do you think heaven's going to look like? If you want to see that, I want to invite you just to pray with us. If you can't bend, pray where you are. But I want to give you the opportunity as Becky comes. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that nobody's better than anybody else in any church and that you are the one that has put us all on equal ground. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for all of us, loving all of us. Thank you for the teachings of Scripture. And may we get our hearts aligned with you. And Lord, that we would commit to praying that we would see this church be that kind of place, just a little piece of heaven here on earth. All people are welcome. For us in Jesus' name we pray. Would you stand with us as we sing? If, if you would like to pray,